Hello, this is Mary Jo Timlin. Welcome to the Teaching Your Toddler Show. Today we have a special guest. Her name is Elizabeth Pecorero, and she is a registered dietitian nutritionist. She's a registered dietitian nutritionist. I knew I was going to have trouble with that. Um, and she's going to talk to us today about her amazing new cookbook that addresses allergies in children and also just her experience as a mom and all the things. So welcome to the show, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about yourself and about your experience with specifically with allergies with your children. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for having me first off. Um, yes, as you said, I am a registered dietitian nutritionist and a mom of two children with multiple food allergies. So I currently have a private practice. I see patients with and without food allergies. I'm also a professor. I teach nutrition at Pace University. And of course, I just finished the cookbook. So that's kind of what's going on in my life right now. Excellent. All right. So when, how old were your children? They were babies when you figured out babies. the babies. My yeah. daughter got diagnosed with her allergies at one year old because back then she's now 11. Um, they told you to wait to introduce mm. the highly allergenic foods so that we kind of missed the boat. So she was diagnosed at one. My son was born in 2014 and we learned a lot. That was the time they were learning a lot more about early introduction. Ah. So we had a great allergist who suggested we test him at six months for some of the top allergens. He tested positive but his skin test was a certain millimeter. It wasn't too large. So they hmm. wanted to give him peanut to see kind of what would happen. So of course I was beside myself, but mm -hmm. the allergist said, this was the, this is the only way that your son may be able to not have a peanut allergy. So we did it. We gave him a peanut protein. You can't give them peanuts because they're too young hmm. and he was not allergic. Hmm. even with a positive skin test. So that also tells you a lot about the testing. Mm -hmm. It is not a hundred percent accurate. So hmm. the allergist then told us you have to be giving him a peanut protein three times a week until the age of five. So he does not grow into this allergy because something is happening in his body. Okay. He tested the skin was positive. Right. Um, so we did exactly like we were told very diligent and he does not have a peanut allergy. Wow. Okay. So there's a lot mm -hmm. to unpack right there. So yes. first of all, you said with your daughter, you missed the boat. Now, what do you mean by that? So now the recommendation is to get the allergens into your child in, the, in infancy. Hmm. So when my daughter was a child or born, it was introduce egg at one year old and introduce the nuts at two years old. Hmm. That is not the case anymore. Okay. At all. You want to, the earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. If you have allergies in your family, or if the sibling has an allergy, talk to the allergist and see what they recommend. They may want you to come into the office, but mm -hmm. you do not want to wait to introduce hmm. these highly allergenic foods. Wow. So, okay. And then with your, with your son, you said you did the test and then what was the millimeter thing is that's, that's like how allergic, like how allergic the reaction I've seen a scratch test before with like, and then when you're really allergic, sometimes it like takes over the whole back, right? Like I, yes. maybe that's what you're not talking about, or I'm not sure. Yes. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So it's a okay. scratch test or a skin test as they mm -hmm. call it. And they put a little bit of the allergen into on, on the arm or the back. Mm -hmm depending mm -hmm. on how old the child is. And then it gets a wheel. So a circular bump, like a mosquito bite. Okay. And then they measure it. Okay. So I think it's three millimeters. Don't quote me, but there's a certain number they're looking for. Okay. And if it's under that, mm -hmm. then there's a chance your child may not be allergic. If it's over that, then they won't even try an oral food challenge, or they may go to the blood test you know, it's a lot of testing to see okay. if you're willing to challenge. I had no idea that there was such a range. And I think that's what I am like reacting to is that there, like, I, I thought you're either it's binary, right? Like you either are, you are not, it's not that sort of range. And so you're saying that with the scratch test or with the, the skin test that it, it, with peanuts, it looked like he was, but he really wasn't. So were there other things that you decided to test on or was that peanut 
one that was sort of inconclusive enough that you decided to do the the protein test, the the oral test? Yes. So they don't, the allergist did not test him on every allergen that my daughter has. That's okay. another thing that's not recommended because hmm. as you know, there's, there's false positives. Okay. So if you get all these positives, then you're taking out so many foods from a child's diet that may not be necessary. And, and anxiety starts building up in the parent Mm -hmm. and then they don't want to introduce the foods. So he did test for a couple, again, it was eight years ago. It's in my book, the whole, the whole um, journey we had. Okay. I think that he tested for peanut, egg, and milk. Hmm. Those were the three that he tested for. Okay. My son did have a dairy allergy in infancy. He outgrew that. Hmm. He was never allergic to egg and he had a positive reaction on the skin test for peanut, but he was challenged and he was not allergic. Didn't work. Okay. So that's an interesting concept as well. So has, it sounds like your daughter has a lot more allergies than their son. Yes. How do you, how do you, how do you sort of figure out that he had grown out of that milk allergy how do you sort of or do you just like give them a little tiny bit every once in a while just to see what happens or like what do you do so when an infant has a dairy allergy they usually present with blood in their stool oh wow so the stool is checked okay and then as they grow a little you know they do it monthly usually when you're older they check you yearly but when they're so young they check them maybe every 4 months just to see if anything changes okay um, then yes they at, after checking him again and the numbers going down they said okay we're going to challenge him and he wasn't allergic again it's a risk and a lot of parents don't like to challenge but the only way you will know if your child has a food allergy is if they ingest that food. That is the only way. Of course, my daughter has a huge positive skin test for peanut and off the charts with the blood test. So they would never challenge her. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Okay. I, 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 I'm I interested in what you said about anxiety because I, I wondered how much anxiety, especially for parents, anxiety sort of um, is a factor in all of this situation when you have a child that has allergies. Yeah. It's a huge factor, um, mm-hmm. especially when they're babies because yeah. they can't communicate with you. Right. So definitely when we got the diagnosis, it was fear. It was anxiety. It was denial. I really had no idea what was going on. Um, but you snap out of that pretty quickly because you have to, cause you're a parent. Mm-hmm. Um, the anxiety is there when she was younger, but I wanted to make sure that I did not give that to her. So she has been fantastic with her allergies. She has challenged a lot. She has passed some challenges and she has not passed some challenges. So she's had reactions Mm -hmm. um, in the hospital when we're challenging. I mean, controlled situation. Controlled situations. Yeah. Now that she is older, I do see a little bit more not anxiety day to day, but they want to start challenging her again. Mm -hmm. And she's not liking that option, but Mm -hmm. they have a lot of things now called, you know, empowering groups. Um, So they talk about bravery and they talk about logic compared to emotions. So we're probably going to get involved with that because there Mm -hmm. could be a chance she has outgrown some of her allergies now. Mm -hmm. And is that pretty common to have, it sounds like it, that it is pretty common for kids to grow out of allergies. Is it just because we sort of get... Uh, um, I don't know if it's acclimated or if our bodies just sort of, yeah, like, I don't know, if we, do we learn over time? Our, our systems kind of get more resilient over time. Is that how you get rid of an allergy? We don't really know. I don't think there's mm-hmm. any concrete answer. We do know that the majority of people do outgrow the egg and dairy allergies, hmm. but the peanuts and the seeds seem to stick with us for longer or a lifetime. Huh. I had no idea. I didn't know that. Um, I've been, I guess, blessed that our children don't have allergies, which is kind of shocking. But um, I, I saw that in your statistics, it's about 8% of children who do. It seems like it's higher. I, I mean, it feels like when you hear about all the kids that have to have like peanut free tables at school and all the things like it seems like it's much more than eight. Yeah, you know, they're saying that if you have a classroom of, say, 30 Mm-hmm. Then probably about three, two to three kids. So yeah, that's about eight to 
yeah. will have a food allergy. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and so I definitely want to talk about your book, but um, from a, from a mom standpoint, how do you recommend moms who do find out that their child has an allergy, but their babies, if they're too small and they're headed to daycare or a babysitter or friend to take care of or whomever, um, you know, how do you sort of properly communicate that if your child is either preverbal or nonverbal, not, not able to speak? Yeah. So you just have to communicate obviously with the caregiver and be mm -hmm. completely clear. You will have an action plan that you will set up with your allergist mm -hmm. in case anything is to happen. And I always recommend prepare the food yourself mm. and send it with the child. Okay. If you only have one allergy, you know, if it's a peanut allergy, a lot of these preschools are peanut free or nut mm. free. Mm -hmm. So that does make it easier, yes. but, you know, always prepare and have your allergy plan with them. They need to know how to administer epinephrine. So you go over mm -hmm. that with them mm -hmm. and it's, it's simple. So, um, and don't keep it as a secret. Some people don't want to burden other people that has not, you know, don't think that way. Everybody has something. This is to keep your child safe and you need to teach your child how to advocate for themselves as they get older. Yes, Absolutely. So speaking of food, you wrote a cookbook. So tell us about that and tell us a little bit about like the evolution of it. And then, you know, whatever you want to tell us with the writing process or anything, but also want to hear about like the actual recipes themselves too. Okay, great. Yeah. So like I said, she was diagnosed at one. And I think for the first year it was denial. My mom even said, these are just all going to go away. Cause we didn't, we didn't know anything. She's like, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't real. This can't be real. Cause she had so many. Um, and she really has more than the average person, mm -hmm. child. So obviously after a year, that did not happen. And I said, all right, it's time. We need to just get into the kitchen and figure this out because everything's going to have to be made from scratch. The allergist was very clear with us. Um, you need to cook. Do not take her out to eat. That was our recommendation at the time. So mm -hmm. I had to get into the kitchen. I know I'm a dietitian, but I did not. I wasn't a huge cook. So I started experimenting and recipe after recipe after recipe, we were lucky. She was a great eater. Good. So everything that she's not allergic to, she eats, which That's is good. amazing. She Very has a fortunate. lot of disease. Yeah. Mm. But if you focus on what your child can have instead of what they can't have, it, mm. it changes everything. It's all about mindset. Mm -hmm. So we started making recipes. I never saved them. It's so, I just wasn't thinking. I just did it and then went to the next one. And probably when she was about seven years old, um, when we went to the doctor, she passed a baked in egg challenge. And the doctor said, okay, now here are the rules. I'm like, rules? Now can I just have baked in egg? Like, can't we just go to a nut-free cupcake place? But there were a lot of rules. You know, you have to bake at a certain degree for a certain amount of time. Wow eggs. So I said, okay, now I'm going to be a permanent baker and chef. Mm -hmm. And at that time I said, I better start saving these recipes. Mm -hmm. So I did. And then probably six months later, I thought to myself, I can help other people. Mm -hmm. You know, if, the, nice. if I had this, when she was diagnosed, mm -hmm. it would have been life-changing. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. And so now you have, it's, it says about 60 recipes in the book, right? Mm -hmm. 60 recipes. And I wanted to incorporate also healthy recipes. So mm. when she was first diagnosed, I just wanted to get anything that was safe. I was looking for every safe cookie known to man, right? And I'm a dietitian. I want my kids to eat healthy and every mom mm -hmm. wants their children to eat healthy. So I wanted to incorporate healthy, simple Mm -hmm. allergy friendly recipes that kids will actually eat and mm -hmm. your partner will eat and you will eat. So you're not making multiple dinners and meals right. for everybody in the family. That's, mm -hmm. you know, I work with people who have that problem without allergies. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yes. yeah. So that, so that, that was is stressful. What was. Add stress to the evening that you don't necessarily need when you have to make multiple versions. And yeah. so, um, is the book, is it, is it, how do you, how did you organize the cookbook? Um, at the beginning is breakfast. Then it goes to soups hmm. and then it goes to mains, sides and sauces, desserts, 
think mm-hmm. that's how it goes. <laughs> and then do you have like a key in there that says if it's peanut free or, or egg free or whatever? Is that every single recipe is written to be top nine allergen free? Wow. Top nine allergen free. Oh my goodness. Top nine okay. allergen free. So if it says pasta, you know, that, and you have a gluten or wheat allergy, mm-hmm. they ha- it adds a little asterisk by it. And then in the back of the book, it's going to give you all your options for the gluten-free brands that you can choose from. Oh, wow. Okay, good. And so I have the nine allergens here, peanuts, tree nuts, eggs, milk, wheat, soy, fish, shellfish, and sesame. Yes. Sesame. That's crazy. I've never heard that one so or I haven't heard it very often. Yeah. Well, because it just became the top ninth allergen this year. Huh. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Is it a seed? It's a seed. So it's kind it's of goes along with the trees seed. and yeah, nuts and seeds allergy, I guess. Yes. Is- we yeah. have seed allergies. Mm-hmm. She happens to have sesame, chia, flax, and mustard seed. Wow. Okay. Goodness. Um, and it, it, do you, do you know anything or in your research and your travels, have you found out like causes for these allergies? Do we know anything about that? We're learning so much and we, we do know, well, again, nothing's hundred percent, but they are narrowing it down and something's happening with the gut microbiome, mm. which everyone has spoken about in a lot of GI issues. Mm-hmm. So the, the good bacteria and the bad bacteria not being in balance, our food supply in this, I mean, in this world, we used to say mm-hmm. in this country, but in this world is not the best, a lot of processed foods. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's what's, what's happening. There's something going on in, in our guts. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, that's, are there anything, any special like cooking methods that you have to worry about? Like, do you have to worry about what kind of oil you're using when you're cooking? I mean, clearly you can't use soy, soy based oil or something like that. Right. So that is a great question. And that is very individualized. So Mm. that's such a great question. Okay. So let's, let's break it down. So oil should not have the protein in it. Okay. So technically you should be able to have the oil, but if it's not refined, very refined, it may have traces. So that is a personal decision that you work with your allergist on. My daughter can have soybean oil. She Hmm. is allergic to soybeans. We do not mess around with peanut oil because how severe her allergy is. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I know my niece actually has a peanut allergy and she's always avoided restaurants that use peanut oil in their, in their recipes because it's just too much of a risk. Yeah. Yeah. That would be another, I guess, thing for someone to think about, right? Again, like you had mentioned, you have to, you have to make most of your food. You can't go out, um, for food. And I know even in like salad dressing, there's oils too, right? Then maybe they're not cooked. I don't know. Does that matter if it's cooked or not cooked? Yeah. You know, the protein can change a little bit, but no, when you have a true allergy, it's not going to change the protein enough for you not to react, except when you have the baked in egg. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people can tolerate baked in milk. Yes. So it does change it a little, but with the Mm -hmm. oils and, you know, with restaurants, you can learn how to navigate a restaurant. Mm -hmm. We do go out, but we go out very, now that she's older, we know what questions to ask. We know what restaurants we trust. Mm -hmm. We know what answers we want to hear. And if we don't hear them, then we don't go there. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. There you go. Well, it's good that you guys are uh, able to get out a bit. That's awesome. Very good. Um, cool. Well, um, let's see, before I let you go, just anything specific about like putting the book together. I'm always curious because I've, I've written a couple of books myself and just that to me, that process is interesting. So did you have any interesting challenges as you put the book together? you know, I had a great, I worked with a great publisher, so they helped me a lot. Um, I am definitely, I have never written a book, Mm -hmm. so, um, they guided me, but the, probably the hardest part is what comes in the index. So I wanted to give the brands and, and, and the appendix, I wanted to give the brands of everything because again, that was so difficult to find not only nut-free foods, but Mm -hmm. manufacturers that didn't have a facility with nuts. 
Oh, okay. So the risk of cross-contamination is a big concern of allergy families, especially when it comes with nuts. Mm. So because the allergies are so severe. So I mm. wanted to list allergy-friendly manufacturers, allergy-friendly websites, and every brand that we use, every product we use in every single recipe is written mm. in the back of the book. Oh, wow. So okay. People have a starting point. I mm -hmm. want them to call themselves because everybody has a different um, comfort level with shared facilities or shared lines. But again, I was starting from, from zero. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what manufacturers were allergy friendly and mm -hmm. nut free facilities. You know, I was just researching and researching and researching and it was mm. exhausting. Oh yeah. So if I had just something to refer mm -hmm. back to, it would have been really helpful. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can't imagine how helpful it would be for someone to to get your book to be able to have just like those specific companies to look at and say, you know, these these are are doing it right and and to not have to do all that legwork for themselves. That's amazing. Um, well, before, again, before I let you go, I want you to tell us a little bit about how to find you, but um, I know you have a, a blog or a website, eatinghealthyforlife.com, and that's the number four. And I'll, I'll put all of these links, of course, in the show notes, but um, is that something that you're working on or is that sort of more, is the cookbook more your focus? Oh, no. The, so the, the website is a huge part of my, um, practice and business. And I do have a blog that I write on monthly. Okay. Um, and I have a private Facebook group called food allergy forum, where all food allergy parents can come and we can chat about the, you know, research. And mm -hmm. of course, if anybody wanted to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, they can contact me through my website. And then of course the book okay. is on there awesome. as well. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Well, great. Well, again, I hope that, uh, I hope that the listeners check this book out if they have any, any allergy challenges with their families, with themselves, with their children or whatever. Um, I think that this sounds like an amazing resource. Clearly you've done all your homework and you had that vested interest for yourself and your family. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for sharing. And, uh, I hope, uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> 